What's up everyone? My name is Kelsey. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing my January wrap-up, so all the books I read in January and some mini reviews. <laughs> Once again, I forgot to do the math before I started recording this, so I'm gonna have to do math on the fly and not great at it. So let's see. Middle grade. I read one middle grade, one young adult, seven adult. So that's a total of nine books in January. Are you gonna be my buddy? You know, okay, let, let me just, <sighs> this is what I should have done the whole time because now I have a new spreadsheet that just, that does all the math for me. That's what I should be doing. All right, I read a total of nine books and it was 1,557 pages and 35.75 hours listened. Wow, that's a lot of audiobooks. Average rating of 3.75, one contemporary, two fantasy, two nonfiction, one paranormal, and two sci-fi. Four audiobooks, three ebooks, two physical books, six adult, one middle grade, one new adult, one young adult. Okay, that was much easier. Okay, so the first book I read in January was The Scorpio Races by Maggie Seafodder. This is a young adult fantasy kind of fabulism. I listened to this on audiobook. It follows two main characters. The first is Puck, who is a teenage girl with two brothers, one younger, one older, and her parents died tragically a few years ago. So it's just her and her brothers trying to survive. And her oldest brother tells them that he is going to leave the island that they grew up on and try to make a life somewhere else. Okay, I should tell you a little bit about the world first. I always do this shit in the wrong order. But this book is set on an island and it's kind of historical. Like, I don't know exactly what year, I can't remember, but I'm guessing like mid 1900s. Probably not even. It's probably like it's such an indeterminate time. Like, I would guess anywhere from, like, 1950 to 1980. Anyways, there, it's set on this island, and pretty much everything is, like, the real world, except for there's this species of animal called water horses, and every year these horses sort of come out of the ocean and migrate onto land temporarily, and <laughs> every November they put on the Scorpio races, where for several weeks, citizens of this island try and capture and train a water horse to compete in the Scorpio races. It's super dangerous. The first line of this book says something like, today is the 1st of November, and so someone will die. Like, it's pretty dramatic. So I already told you about Puck, and after her brother says that he is going to move away from the island, she decides that she is going to compete in the Scorpio races just to keep him there a little longer with the bonus being that the winner of the Scorpio races wins a bunch of money and her, and she'll be able to survive on the island a little longer with her brother. Our second main character is Sean, whose father died in the Scorpio races and he has been working as like a horse trainer ever since then. He races in the Scorpio races every year and does very well every time, but what he really wants is to have his own water horse and race it for himself instead of for the owner of this, I don't even know what you would call it, ranch? I don't know a lot about horses. So pros for this book are, I loved the sibling relationship between Puck and her brothers. It felt really realistic and that she loves them a lot, but they also drive her insane and she complains about them a lot, but also she would die for them. And that felt pretty accurate for a teenager. I also loved the world and ended up loving like the whole, Everything around the Scorpio races, there's like festivals and fairs and long-standing traditions that were just super interesting. Maggie Stiefvater, like all of her books that I read, it's like I'm reading them and I feel like I don't really care about what's happening. And then I, it's like it sneaks up on me and I get to the end of the book and suddenly I love everything about all of the characters and the world and I just want to live there. It's such an odd feeling, but that's how it's been with pretty much all of her books that I've read. Also, her writing is just beautiful. There's like a bunch of lines in here that just like stick with you. And it just felt so, so atmospheric. My cons for this book are that, I mean, it's a bit slow and that's kind of a feature of Maggie's writing. Everything is so slow to build that it takes me a while to get into the story. I ended up giving this four stars. I really enjoyed it. I really loved the audiobook, so I would recommend that if you read it. It was like a good way to start the year, like a solid read. All right, the second book I finished in January was The Library of the Unwritten by A.J. Hackwith. This is an adult fantasy. 
and I got this copy at the library. So, The Library of the Unwritten is book one of the Hell's, I think it's the Hell's Library trilogy, and it follows our main character, Claire, who is the librarian of the Unwritten Wing in Hell, which is where all the books that remain unwritten or are not yet written live, and Claire takes care of them. So at the beginning of the book, one of the characters from the Unwritten Wing escapes his book and leaves the library in order to find his author to convince her to write the story. That's very clearly not allowed, so Claire and her assistant Brevity leave the library to go hunt him down and bring him back. And then, like, a whole bunch of shit takes off from there. That, like, that first part, that's not what the book is about. <laughs> There's so much more involved. A bunch of other parts of Heaven and Hell get involved. There's a bigger plot concerning a book written, like an evil book. So my pros for this book are that that world setup is super interesting, the concept is really interesting, and like all of the settings they go to are super inventive, and all of the characters individually are really interesting. My cons for this book are that I did not care about the interactions between each of the characters. It's like if I separated each character from each other, I cared about them, but I didn't care about them interacting with each other, I didn't care about the journeys they were on, I didn't really care about their mission. There was a lot, there were a lot of different settings in this book and they're constantly, it's like a long journey and they're constantly moving from one setting to the next to the next, working their way through the story, but it was just a lot to keep track of and all that different world building and all of the different magic that was introduced and, and mythology that was talked about was just too much and I found it really boring. There were several times in this book that I almost DNF'd it, but it's like every time I was like, all right, if I don't start liking it soon, I'm gonna put it down. Then like one little, one little plot twist would come up and I'd be like, hmm, that's interesting. And it would be just enough to keep me going. So <laughs> overall, I can't say I enjoyed the book. I ended up giving it two and a half stars and I totally understand why s some people would like it, but I did not really. All right, book three. The Best at It by Malik Pencholi. This is a middle grade contemporary book. I listened to the audiobook. It follows Rahul, who is a middle schooler who is trying to figure out what his thing is, what he is going to focus on, like what his passion is, what he's going to be the best at. So my pros with this book are I loved the relationship he had with his grandfather, which is where his whole finding something he's the best at came from. Um, and he calls him Bai, which technically means brother because his grandfather says he wants him to feel like Rahul could come to him with anything and talk to him about anything. And I just thought they were like so sweet and I loved that relationship. Rahul also has a crush on one of his classmates, a boy, and he's dealing with that as well. And I think that was handled really well, but it didn't like overwhelm the story. You know, that's not what it's about, but it is an aspect of his character. And just overall, I liked the message of the story and Rahul's journey throughout, you know, trying all these different things out. And he keeps trying all of these things that he thinks he should be good at because he's a boy and because he wants to fit in with his like average, typical like white American friends. But everyone around him, all of his friends and family encourage him to just do the things he wants to do. And I just really enjoyed it. <laughs> I ended up giving this four stars. It was super sweet. The whole thing by Hank Green. This is an adult sci-fi. I listened to the audiobook and it follows a woman in her 20s, April May, who one night walking home in the middle of the night from her job where she's overworked, stumbles upon this big metal, what she thinks is a sculpture. So she calls her friend and they put together a really quick YouTube video where she interviews this robot, it names it Carl, and the next day they post it online. And from there, things just take off because apparently one of these Carls has been installed in a bunch of major cities all over the world. They came out of nowhere. There's no footage of them being installed. People theorize that it would cost billions of dollars to pull something like that off. So it's a huge mystery. And because it's such a big mystery and because April May was one of the first people to post videos, especially such a personable video and the sculptures get their name Carl from that video, she gets internet famous very quickly. <laughs> and the book is sort of part mystery about the Carls and 
where they're from and what they're there for and part April May's personal journey dealing with sudden unexpected internet fame. I ended up really enjoying this. Like I picked this up because it just happened to be available at my library and I feel like all of the descriptions I've seen of this book didn't do, like they don't really do it justice. It's a really interesting story. I personally really enjoyed April May as a character. I know there are some like really unlikable aspects to her personality and I feel like maybe listening to the audiobook made her easier to take as a person because, you know, it's in the first person and the narrator is speaking to you as if she is April May. And I think because of that, it made her a little easier to take. So I understand why people find her unlikable, but I actually ended up liking her. Like some people, you know, people aren't perfect. So I thought the flawed aspects of her character made sense. Also, I thought April May was fucking hilarious. She makes really really bad jokes and sometimes poorly timed jokes when she's stressed and I found that relatable and very funny. Also, April May is bi. At the beginning of the book, she's in a relationship with another girl and that's part of the story, so I don't want to say more. But the bi rep is kind of a, a, an important aspect of her character because she takes on a public persona. My cons for this book are that it was a bit repetitive with when they're uncovering the mystery, there are like some systems they have to go through over and over and the narration of that got like a little boring because I knew it was coming every time and I also felt it was a little bit preachy <laughs> like the message got a little preachy talking about um you know the conflicts people get into online I, I feel like it could have been handled a little more subtly but I really enjoyed it I ended up giving it four stars and I would recommend it <laughs> all right book five is Bonds of Brass by Emily Skretsky and this is this is technically an adult sci-fi. It's published in an adult imprint, but the characters are in their late teens. So I would really call this new adult. And I think it would be like a good crossover from young adult to adult. I received an arc of this book. I actually got the arc last year, but I wanted to wait to read it and for a totally selfish reason because I didn't want to be the only one. <laughs> I knew I was going to love it, okay? And I didn't want to be the only one talking about this for very long. I want other fans <laughs> to read this book so that I have someone to talk to about it. A little background first. I love Emily Scretzi's writing. One of um, my favorite books with the female female romance is The Abyss Surrounds Us. I recommend it all the time. So when she announced this book, I added it to my want to read immediately. I think that was early last year that I heard about it. And when the arcs were available, I was like, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna hope I get it. So this book follows Etienne and Gail, who are both students at this military academy seven years after the Umber Empire invaded this empire and won. So Etienne is a survivor of the war and he lived on the streets for years after the war ended, surviving on his own because his parents were killed. He felt abandoned by his people because no one was there to care for him after the fall of the empire. And eventually he was pulled into you know, whatever social services this new empire had and made it to this military academy where he's an excellent pilot and is determined to rise through the ranks and survive. That's pretty much his only goal is survival. At this military academy, he made a friend in Gail, who is his roommate and is pretty much his closest friend and one of the only people he feels any loyalty to towards. So Gail is charming and friendly and popular with everyone at this academy after an attempt on his life by the other survivors of the old empire, it's revealed that Gael is the heir to the Umber Empire. So Etienne and Gael escape together, but Etienne starts questioning how well he even really knows Gael, and he initially wants to save him because he thinks, he thinks if Gael takes over the empire, he will change it. After Etienne and Gael escape, they meet another character, Wen, who becomes part of their like trio of friends. And Wen and Etienne get along very well because they both know what it's like to survive on the streets. Wen is the child of mob boss, basically, but her mother was killed during some gang violence. And now Wen is trying to survive, build her own system, and get revenge on the people that killed her family. So my pros for this book is that it was completely thrilling from start to finish, which is something that I like about Emily Scretzi's writing. She also wrote Hall Metal Girls, and that's another one where... It's pretty much nonstop action, start to finish. Um, 
the space battles were super interesting and that's usually usually an aspect of sci-fi that I get really bored during but they were super engaging and so suspenseful it's super emotional there's a romance between Gail and Etienne if you didn't already know that if you couldn't guess <laughs> from the summary that's where it was going but she's so good at writing like pining and longing it was just excellent but the let's see the ramifications of all of these actions are so much bigger than i expected them to be there is a lot of political stuff going on there are a lot of there's a lot of underhanded things there's a lot of what's the word there's a lot of suspicion between etienne and gail which was like a really interesting dynamic because they are also kind of getting romantically involved and still distrusting each other and i just really enjoyed that i worry because I mean, I don't have any cons for this book, let's be real. I gave it five stars. I fucking loved it. I worry that people are going to, that young adult fans are going to read this book and be upset because this is not a cut and dry, these two should be together. It's way more complicated than that. And I know I've seen a ton of people comparing this to Finpo from Star Wars, and this is not Finpo. <laughs> I mean, at the very bit, like, they're fighter pilots and they're in love, that's it. That, that's all they have in common. And I worry that Finpo fans are going to read this and hate it because it's nothing like Finpo. Um, like, Gale is going to inherit an empire that destroyed Etienne's life. Like, if, if that's not complicated, I don't know what is. All right, moving on. I talked about that one long enough. You'll probably hear about it a lot more. I'm sure I will be recommending it. Oh, I also want to note that there was a lot of stuff going on around about um, because the main character in this book is black, Etienne is black, um, and Emily Skretsky is white. Just so you're aware, it's not on voices. Okay, book six. So you want to talk about race by Ijoma Aluo. This is an adult nonfiction. I listened to the audiobook, which was excellent. This is just about, I don't want to say it's for white people because there's a good amount of, um, information for other races. It's definitely for the Western world and... It's definitely, it encourages people to look at their privilege and get better at talking about race and like a public discourse. I especially liked the sections on affirmative action, appropriation, uh, the model minority myth. There's quite a bit on tone policing and pretty much this book reiterates over and over that if you want to be involved in discussions of race, you are probably going to be uncomfortable and you're just gonna have to get over it. Like, it's, it's just a fact of life. I ended up getting it five stars. I would totally recommend it. All right, book seven, Sex Positive by Dr. Kelly Neff. This is another adult nonfiction. I read this as an arc. It's supposed to be about <laughs> changing social beliefs surrounding sex and gender, but I pretty much hated it. I gave it one star. There were a lot of problems. I'm, after this video, I'm filming an entire rant review about this book. So if you're interested in hearing more of my negative thoughts about that, that's coming. It's going to be releasing after this wrap-up, so I'll link it up here whenever it's done. Okay, book eight, City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. This is an adult fantasy. I own this one. Oh, yay. Oh, shoot. I actually do have the Library of the Unwritten, and I forgot to hold it up. All right, this book follows Nari, who is a woman living in Cairo in what year? The 16th century? 17th century? Something like that. And she has always had some special abilities. She can understand and speak any language she ever hears. And she can sense what's wrong with people's bodies and sometimes heal them. And her body heals well quickly as well. And one day, while trying to fake perform an exorcism, she accidentally summons a djinn. And when she does that, she sets off a bunch of mythological people that are after her and want to kill her. So the djinn takes her to an alternate universe to save their lives, and it follows her from there. We also follow the city of Devabad and the political goings on there. There's a lot of, what's the word? There's a lot of hate between these tribes, okay? So the gist is, however many hundreds of years ago, the djinn were cursed and separated into different tribes with different traits, and ever since then, there have been conflicts between these tribes and wars between them. So you're following all of that conflict and how it is reflected in the social structure of this city 
and how the leaders of the city are dealing with it. Super interesting. My pros for this book are the expansive world building. Like the world building is insanely detailed and there's just so much going on. I think it's impressive that she managed to keep everything making somewhat sense. I'll be honest, like there are a lot of words in here that I just made up my own way of keeping track of things. I actually really liked the characters. I have this thing for like flawed characters. Uh, there were a lot of people that read this book. I read this for the Book Push book club and people said they didn't like the characters because they weren't good people. I guess I just like bad people. I don't know because I thought they were all super interesting and even though they all made terrible decisions at times, I knew where they were coming from and I guess that's a good way to write complex characters. I loved Ali the most <laughs> and I really like the way the author wrote these like complex relationships with his family because he is, his father and mother are from two different tribes so there's like some complicated relationships between his family members because of that and I think she did a great job writing that. The magic was super interesting and I liked the way everything was depicted. I enjoyed Nari's character development. I don't even know if I'm saying her name correctly. My only cons for this book are that it was slow to start. Like Nari doesn't even get to the city until halfway through the book but up until that point she's just traveling with Dara and it was kind of slow but I enjoyed the rest of the book so much that that only really knocked it down half a star so I ended up rating this four and a half stars and I will definitely be reading the second book. There is a serious cliffhanger at the end of this book in like a huge twist that shocked me. So, but I only finished it like two days before February and in February I'm trying to read only female female books. So I can't read it until March. All right, so the last book I read was To the Flame by A.E. Ross. This is a new adult paranormal romance. This is also an arc. It follows Emerson, who is a new college student dealing with some things. First, his first night at this university after he moves into his dorm, he goes to a party, meets someone, they go back to their dorm, this other person kisses them, and then stops speaking to them completely. So Emerson is upset about that. At the same time, he has randomly started being saved by the radio station. As in, he'll be walking home and listening to the radio and suddenly the radio will say, Emerson, take a step back and he'll avoid being hit by a car or some shit. So he's trying to figure out what the fuck is going on there and also having romantic feelings for his roommate. We also follow Maury. Yeah, moth person powers, which was interesting. But apparently these moth person powers manifest in ways that they can see the death of people they care about. So Maury is trying to avoid their attraction to Emerson because they don't want to deal with the pain of knowing all of the different ways and possible times that Emerson could die. This is a really short book. I think it was like 80 pages or translate to 80 pages in a physical copy. It was odd but charming and there was like good chemistry between the characters. Also super queer, like casually queer. Everyone is queer. Maury is non-binary um, and it like there's no homophobia. It's just a great super casual queer world and I love that shit. I just felt like because it was so short we were missing out on a lot especially development of the romance between the two characters like there just like wasn't a lot that happened between them before the resolution of the book so I felt like there could have been a lot more there. Also I would like to know more about moth people <laughs> like it's definitely something I haven't read before. So I ended up giving us three and a half stars. Like I enjoyed it, but I definitely felt it had, it was missing some stuff that I would have enjoyed more. All right, that's everything I read in January. So let me know if you've read any of these and what you thought of them or what you read in January and loved that I should add to my TBR. If you like this video, hit like. If you wanna see more, subscribe. I post book related videos every Wednesday. If you want to keep talking, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Kelsey Reads or Goodreads at Kelsey Lynn Reads. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.